Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here for our final presentation of the afternoon. We really appreciate it. I know it's been a very long day. Um, I have been here all day and I know that there are like little issues with our, our remote. So um, please grant us some grace in this final presentation. We have a wonderful presentation for you here today on the importance of art. So I'm Robin Berkland. I work with the Families and Long-Term Care Projects team. And um, I basically work with families and individuals with memory loss on our intervention studies. So today we are going to be talking about art with our panel of artists. And we have a wonderful, wonderful panel here of, of individuals representing art museums in the local Twin Cities area. We also have community art programs represented as well. And we're going to go through and talk about the importance of art and the importance of making and creating and viewing art. We're going to talk about their dementia friendly art programs. And we're going to talk a little bit because it is the pandemic, a little bit about COVID and how that has impacted their programs. Um, we will start out with some introductions here. Um, and here's our first thing. Is it? It's actually not. Also, there may be an issue with being able to see me over the podium, but that's not an AV issue. That's just because I'm short and apparently the same size as this podium. And I feel like I should have a little, little box to step on, but right now I'm just standing on my tiptoes. <laughs> Is it good? Nope. We're getting there. Once the slides come, there we go. Okay, so we're a little bit ahead. So I'm just gonna try to take us back in time, which may mean, there we go. Okay, so I'd like to introduce our panelists. We have three here and one joining us on Zoom. So I would like to introduce those who are here first. In the middle, we have Michelle Coppin. She is a teaching artist with the Minnetonka Center for Arts and she works with the Arts and Dementia Seniors Program. To her left is Steve Pye. He is a Senior Services and Activities Manager also with the City of Minnetonka, so he will talk to us about some other programs. And then all the way to the right here, we have Debbie Hegstrom, who is a PhD and a Senior Educator with the Discover Your Story Program at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. Joining us on Zoom, we have Jessica Hakla, and she is the Education Programs Assistant with the Contemporary, Journey, the Contemporary Journeys at Walker Art Center. And she has a lovely background behind her. That's awesome. <laughs> and she will be starting us out with hers, uh, her presentation about her program. Um, for those who are getting CEUs, we wanted to make sure that we have the objectives so that it is very um, official, but we will be very casual up here. Uh, so just so you know, objectives to take a good look at how you start and, and, and grow a dementia friendly art program. Um, just talking a little bit about um, the benefits of creating art and the importance of art in general in caring for individuals with memory loss. And also we wanted to talk about COVID and, and obviously that's impact on, on these programs and how they've run for the last year and a half basically um, and what kind of really creative ways that they've approached um, dealing with the COVID pandemic and also um, future directions for, for where they see the, the programs going from here. So we will start with Jessica, who is going to talk through um, a good 15 minutes about the, her program, Contemporary Journeys, and, and how things play out there. So I will throw it over to you, Jessica. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Does everything sound okay? You sound great. Okay, great. <laughs> I can actually hear myself <laughs> echoing in the distance. So I may have some awkward pauses where I'm like, hmm, that's me. Um, anyway, I will get started here. Thank you for having me here today. Um, this is probably the first time I've ever done a presentation. So please bear with me as I go through. <laughs> my name is Jessica Hakla, as Robin said. Um, and I, my title is Education Programs Assistant at the Walker Art Center. Um, so I've worked there for about eight years now. I actually started in the security department and I just started as a gallery assistant, to the guards who kind of monitor the galleries and ask people not to touch things. Um, and then I moved up into control center and then chief guard, which is the position that kind of supervises the gallery assistants. 
And then I transitioned to the education department three years ago, and that is what I have been doing since. Um, and my main roles are mostly overseeing tour scheduling and logistics and providing support for our tour and workshop programs, including Contemporary Journeys. Um, and when I started in this role, uh, I basically started just kind of helping with the Contemporary Journeys program, and it's gotten to the point now where I manage most aspects of it, which is um, pretty cool. Not something that I expected when I started in my basically tour scheduling position. So um, it's been really great. Um, so through, throughout my presentation, I will just start with some context about how our program came to be. Um, and then I will explain what it actually looks like. And then we can talk a little bit about how things are going now with COVID and feel free to interrupt me at any time with questions. I'll try to keep an eye on the chat. I'm pretty well versed with Zoom. So um, yeah, so our program started in 2008. The Walker was approached by uh, Katie Westberg, the National Director of Life Enrichment from a senior living organization called the Goodman Group. And she asked the Walker if we would be interested in creating a new program for people with memory loss, similar to a program at uh, MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art. They had a program called Meet Me at MoMA. And the Walker was like, of course, we're interested in giving that a shot. So um, we started with a pilot program and it was designed with input from the Alzheimer's Association of Minnesota, North Dakota. Uh, Walker staff tested the program with two memory care units over the course of nine months and they were really astounded by the results. Um, they found that residents were highly engaged, they were making creative choices in their art projects, um, and it really was above and beyond the expectations of the people that formed the program. Um, so then our former uh, Associate Director of Education, Courtney Gerber, she applied for a grant for $50,000 from the MetLife Foundation and received it, and that was what um, gave us the money we needed to start the program. So then on this slide, you can see Dr. Joseph Gogler, who I don't think I need to introduce because I believe he uh, presented earlier today. Um, but part of this pilot program was that he came in and did a professional evaluation of our program. Um, basically, they were looking at determining if this contemporary journeys program would have positive effects on participants' moods and emotional states. And the results showed that it did. Um, he concluded contemporary journeys may motivate increased engagement in enjoyable activities that encompass more than just art, sparking a different and more proactive approach to living with memory loss, one that involved increased engagement in a wide range of enjoyable activities. So we can get to the next slide and start talking about what our Contemporary Journeys program actually looks like. Um, so our experiences are about 75 minutes in length. Um, we limit the groups to about 10 people um, and their care partners. So we keep the groups pretty small. Um, we start with a tour of our galleries um, where we'll usually see two to three artworks. So really not a whole lot, but we spend a lot of time talking about each individual artwork and kind of digging deep into it. Um, we usually do a specific theme for each tour. So some of the themes that we have done are portraits or landscapes, identity, um, figures, home. Um, we also do tours that are focused on specific exhibitions or the Minneapolis Sculpture Garden which is where the Spoon Bridge is located that you can see behind me. <laughs> um, and we choose these themes because they are very universal, but they're also very personal. It, they're the type of themes that anyone can kind of um, relate to. And throughout the experience, one thing that is um, pretty important is that the Walker's building is extremely confusing and <laughs> very complicated. And we often have things in our galleries that might have really loud noises or flashing lights and stuff like that. So we're very careful in planning our tours that we can avoid the rickety lift elevators, we can avoid stairs, we can av avoid some of those audio and visual disturbances um, and just make it a stress-free and fun, fun, um, fun event. Um, so we can take a look at the next slide. So throughout our tour, um, we're very interactive and we invite participation. 
And verbal responses are great, but nonverbal responses are welcome just as much. Um, the facilitator will ask questions in simple yes or no form, uh, framing it in present or future tense. And she will share touch objects throughout the tour um, so that it's not just, let's look at a thing on the wall. Let's, let's make it a little bit more dynamic. Um, so on the next slide, here's an example of one of the touch objects that we would share. For instance, if we're looking at this Marsden Hartley painting um, of this beautiful mountainous forest, we'd pass around a um, pine scented air freshener um, and everyone gets a chance to smell it. And, you know, scent is just such a strong memory enhancement. Um, like for me, I smell a certain perfume from middle school and I remember what it was like to be in gym class. Um, so it's kind of similar in that way where you can smell it and think, mm, I can imagine being in this forest, in this painting. Um, and then other things that we've passed around, like we look at a piece um, by the artist Jim Hodges, which is made up of all these really beautiful scarves and you can't touch the artwork typically. So we would pass around a scarf for people to feel or um, the piece that we looked at in one of the previous slides, it uses these like hair curling papers. And so we pass around hair curlers and that sparks conversation when people uh, feel that and they remember like, oh, my mom used to curl her hair or, or whatever. So um, it's like a fun aspect of it. And then we can go to the next slide. Here is a picture from inside our art lab, which is the Walker's kind of art making studio. And after we do the tour of the galleries, we head down to this space and we get to make an artwork that is related to the theme of the tour and to the pieces that we took a look at. So in this particular instance, um, it's a piece that we call Collectible, and it's related to an exhibition that we had up for a long time called I Am You, You Are Too, which focuses on identity. And in making this project, participants get to make a little identity shadow box kind of thing, as you can see um, in the foreground here. And we basically provide, well, we provide the box and then we provide all these uh, individual little items that they can choose. And so there's little animals, there's miniature trees, uh, seashells, little mini cars, paper and felt and things to decorate with. And what's fun about it is people get to choose whatever it is that speaks to them. Sometimes uh, we have little flags from different countries. So someone may say, I have Swedish heritage. Do you have a Swedish flag? And we find it and they add it to their, their little piece or, um, in this case, the one close up, the person said, I really like buffaloes. And so they put a buffalo on it. Um, and then everybody gets to title their piece, which is another fun aspect of it. Um, you know, participants usually come up with something that evokes a happy place like Jim's garage or Mary's beach vacation. Um, so it's really fun to see these like positive little vignettes that come out of creating the project. Um, and it's been really wonderful. I get to participate in each of these, you know, kind of helping um, with the supplies, passing things around and getting things all set up. And it's really wonderful to see people that maybe were more withdrawn at the start of the tour. And then they come down to the art lab and they just open up and they start, you know, talking about like, oh, I love this little car. It reminds me of, uh, one woman talked about, it reminded her of the Corvette that her husband then boyfriend had. And she told us the story multiple times um, throughout the time that she was there, but every time she was so, so full of joy when she talked about it, it was, it was amazing. Um, and then, yeah, one of the things too that I have found the most rewarding in this is just hearing how much people say they really appreciate the social aspect of this program or programs like this. Um, because it can be very isolating, of course, living with memory loss or even, you know, for elderly people in general, it can be really isolating sometimes. And so having an opportunity to get out of the house and to go to a different place and be surrounded by people that are experiencing the same thing that you are is really important. So I just put together some quotes here. Um, I'll let you read them, but we've gotten a lot of positive feedback from participants that have really enjoyed the program. So I'll give a second to read that. Okay, so 
we can take a look at the next one here. This is a screenshot from um, PBS NewsHour. So this is pretty neat right before the pandemic hit, um, probably about a month or so before things shut down, we were featured on PBS NewsHour. Um, so I for sure will share that link afterwards. Um, if anybody's interested in watching it, it's available on the PBS website. But um, the segment is led by Eileen krug -Majsalov. I might not be pronouncing her last name correctly, but um, she's pictured here. Uh, Eileen has been heavily involved in this program since the beginning. She has basically been um, the main person that writes uh, all of the tours and gives all of the tours. And she used to work at Walker full time, but after retiring, she came back and basically took uh, took over the Contemporary Journeys program. Like it is her program and I can't emphasize enough how super, super important she is to it. Um, but I would invite you to watch this. It's really great. We do a tour of the sculpture garden and um, interview some of the participants. And it just was a really, really wonderful experience. Um, just so, so full of joy, but I'll share that afterwards. And then on the next slide, um, this is kind of bringing us up to the present moment. So we, at the start of the pandemic, you know, we realized, of course, we had to stop all in-person activities, including tours and especially the Contemporary Journeys program, because obviously it's a very vulnerable population. Um, but we surveyed some of the care facilities that have visited us in the past and asked them if they'd be interested in us maybe doing a virtual version of the program. And so we didn't get a ton of feedback because it is, you know, it's hard to get survey responses in the best of times, but of course, care homes were like really hit hard by the pandemic and, you know, people are scrambling to, to figure things out. But the very few responses that we got were super positive where people said, yes, we would absolutely love a virtual program. So we put together three video programs. You can see little screenshots from each. So one focuses on abstract artwork. One is a landscape, um, kind of road trip, which is really fun, and then one that focuses on portraits. And so each one is very similar to the in-person program where um, we take a look at three, two to three pieces, and then there's an art making component at the end. So it's a little bit like Bob Ross at the end, which I think is really actually very nice, whether you're making the project along with it or you play for a little, play the video for a little while and then pause it and then work on your piece or Maybe you just like to watch people make stuff, which I myself enjoy doing sometimes. <laughs> um, so that was the latest that we did with our program. At this point, we're not yet offering in-person contemporary journeys, but we are planning to start it up again this fall now that things are safer. And most likely we'll go back to um, what we were doing before with the in-person tour through the galleries and the art making experience. but. You know, virtual offerings have really opened up new possibilities for us. Um, we've been able to see groups, uh, school groups from all over the country because of uh, the pandemic and doing things virtually. So it's possible that we'll continue some virtual components for contemporary journeys as well in the future, but we're not quite sure yet. So. That I think is about the end of my presentation. Thank you so much everyone for listening to me talk and for inviting me here today. And if you have any questions, please let me know. But, oops, gone too far. Um, Maybe at the end we'll have some more. And I know I have some, but I'll wait on those. Um, all right, thank you so much, Jessica. That was great. We really appreciate it. And it sounds amazing. And I, I'm gonna have to do the Bob Ross at the end of those videos because I wanna learn how to do do the things that, that artists can do. Um, so we're gonna move on now to Discover Your Story, which is the program from the Minneapolis Institute of Art. So I'm gonna throw it over to Debbie and I will give you the... Hi, I'm Debbie Hagstrom from Minneapolis Institute of Art, a senior educator there. And I've been working there 24 years in July. 
So I've seen a lot of changes. And one of the great programs that came into being in my time there is our Discover Your Story tours for people with memory loss. We actually started this program. Oh, I'm gonna go just, there's our, our building. You can see there. We're the big museum south of downtown. So we started our program I also with a request, um, a woman who was a coordinator at Lingblomston who had a weekly respite group meeting, people who came from their homes to this location to get together, talk about different topics, and asked us if we could send someone to talk about art. We're so fortunate to have over 300 volunteer guides at Mia. And so we decided, I went out with one of our docents and we just started talking about art in that setting. And that went on for a little while, just sort of checking how that worked. And then we decided to prototype a program at the museum starting in 2008. And after many discussions and sort of figuring out how this would work, we decided to call it Discover Your Story at Mia tours for visitors with memory loss and their friends, because we wanted to emphasize that you're in an art museum, but you're not there to learn lots of facts and figures about works of art. This is an audience that really we want to stay in the moment. And so we wanted our tours to be about creating and sharing stories that would be inspired by what they were looking at, but also bring in engaging the senses and in that way spark conversation. And that's similar to things that Jessica was telling you. Because we're a comprehensive art museum with so many possibilities, we could take a journey around the world to explore all kinds of images, food, landscapes, certain kinds of characters in paintings and sculptures. But our main objective was that this would be a personal, relaxed time for people with mem memory loss and their care partners, a time to reminisce, to reflect, and to tap into life stories. So I'm just going to show you one of our favorite paintings to have on one of our Discover Your Story tours, this dining room in the country a wonderful setting in Southern France in an impressionistic style by a French artist. And basically what we wanna do here is just step into this painting. Put yourself into this painting. Where are you? What are you seeing? What are you smelling? How does the sun feel? There are a couple of cats, might be able to see them or not, but people start discovering just the the various aspects of what this dining room has within it. And then in front of that painting, I'm showing you here docent Jane Tigerson, who was instrumental as we were prototyping and developing our program. She made so many contacts for us, helped us with um, contacting with Alzheimer's Association and other things going on in the Twin Cities, she would always bring something related to the painting on her tours. Here she's got some plants where you could actually, you know, herbs that you could crinkle up and, and just get that wonderful sensory experience of smelling those herbs. Jane has a website called opendoorstomemory.org. I recommend that you look for that online. She's done lots of teaching and working with other museums to develop these programs. Well, after a couple year process of prototyping and trying this out, we decided this was a really a great opportunity and very successful program. So we started incorporating other aspects into our tours as well. Here's Joanne in our America's Gallery and she was looking at some ceramics that were used for drinking hot cocoa or some of these ceramics used for 
drinking chicha, which was a fermented beverage, a type of beer, and she's handing some spices to one of the participants. The hot cocoa always contained chili powder or cayenne or hot peppers. And so thinking about that beverage and being able to smell the spices of that beverage as you're talking about and looking at these vessels. Or going into our Japanese galleries and looking at this wonderful screen of a tiger emerging from bamboo. With works like this, we started to incorporate poetry into our tours. You see docent Kathleen with her arms raised up in the background. She's very energized and passionate about these tours. And so we worked with Alzheimer's Poetry Project. I'll say a little bit more about them later. And with Ann Basting, who through um, her work at University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, introduced us to these whole aspects of storytelling and writing poems to go with works of art. So Kathleen would sit in the gallery with her group and ask questions and people would just start to throw out phrases about this tiger. What is this tiger doing? Where is this tiger? How does this tiger feel? Oftentimes the docents then would have someone with them who would write down every phrase that was spoken. And at the end, through the combination of all of these phrases, a poem would be created. And then that could be read out loud to the group as you know the accomplishment that they had for, for their time looking at this work. Whoop. <laughs> this is very sensitive. Wonder. Okay, so I mentioned Alzheimer's Poetry Project. Um, a man named Gary Glazner out of New York started this. There is a Minnesota branch as well. I encourage you to look them on, up online, a woman named Zoe Beard, who is their coordinator. Gary came into our museum. We brought in Kairos Alive, which I hope you've also heard of an organization that really brings music and dance into these gatherings with people with memory loss. So we had a poetry project party with music and dance and people who came in just to celebrate together, to create poetry together. And then um, if, you, if you've ever encountered Gary, he always creates sort of a rhythm in his poetry and creates a, a really joyful, exciting experience for everyone. So I wanna also just tell you a few things that have resulted in terms of participants in our program. We did do a research study with Joe Gogler to look at care partners and see if they're affected by the tours and how they feel about what's accomplished by being at these tours. This is one of my favorite quotes from that study. I love to see them be goofy and giggle. We need to slow down to let them think about what they're seeing, smelling, feeling, and the memories that come back will flow. So important to tap into those memories. Or at a particular painting, where you're looking at it and just absorbing the beauty of this landscape here in Yosemite, where a tour guide is recounting her experience with her group, that this gallery that was filled with American landscape paintings, the group sat before this scene in Yosemite National Park and sang America the Beautiful. And it seemed like everybody knew most of those words and we even had someone join in and do a drum roll for a sound effect. Another favorite painting that we've used on these tours, Married Life, which gives us a chuckle. And our tour guide saying how it's not a tour about teaching about this work of art or this artist, but just remembering experiences sometimes from childhood, 
sometimes from your older ages into marriage. And so this particular tour guide was asking people, talk about what it takes to have a good or long marriage and the stories that come out of that discussion. I love this quote from one of our guides because she's really talking about these, you know, a lot of our tours are planned for so carefully. Here's what I'm gonna show, here's what I'm gonna talk about. But on this type of tour, you need to be ready for the element of surprise that adds to the fun. So the people who come who have a wide range of memory loss from visitors who've recently diagnosed to those who are well down the road, but you never know what might resonate in a work of art and even what they're processing. And so I think this is such an important statement at the end. Just because they're silent, confused, or not sharing does not mean they are not appreciating the art. And we really love to allow for the silence. As you sit in front of the work of art and take it in, just absorb what you see, what you feel, what you might be thinking or smelling, to not be afraid of the silence. So those were tours that we were conducting about an hour in length, looking at maybe three to four different works of art. We also started adding in some art activities after doing a tour. In this case, we would do a shorter tour first. And we might just look at one work of art to spark some memories, to inspire people, and then go into our studios and start creating something related to what had been looked at. So again, it's about being in the moment, being together and sharing those ideas. I love this activity it was in the fall where our art teacher brought in colored leaves that she'd picked up from outside. Very simple supplies, colored pencils, watercolors. And then she provided a sheet of paper that would have a picture on it, just something cut out of a magazine. This is something I think anyone can do at home as well. Something that would start the picture and we were talking about celebrations and Thanksgiving and had talked a lot about memories about those times spent together. And then people would work with their care partners to finish the picture. It really gave a sense of, you know, not staring at a blank piece of paper and what do I do, but instigating some ideas through um, an image on the paper and then completing it. And then as Jessica was saying, an essential part of this is to share those ideas and stories at the end. We also have done what she called identity boxes. We call them treasure boxes. We would start out our session together looking at a treasure at Mia. What do we call a treasure? Why is it a treasure? And then go into the, the art studio. And with the same thing, just a whole array of materials that people can pull from to create a box that reflects who they are and what they treasure. This man um, played jazz piano and so really drew on those memories and that love of piano for him. Or another person who just pulled in things maybe from tinkering around the house, batteries, a rent. <coughs> Sorry, just need a quick drink of water. So one of the last things I wanna talk about is are these booklets that we created. We did wanna extend the visit beyond the tour. What is a way that someone could continue to talk about the art? Do they left? And also during the pandemic, because people were not able to come to the museum, a way to bring something back with you. It's it's actually, I don't think they can see me, but oh, it's actually a booklet filled with images 
and then uh, places for stories. So I just have a few pages to show you. There, the front and back you see here, there are instructions on how to use the book, but it's really very basically looking at an image. There are prompts with open-ended questions that you can use to create a story to go along with the image. And everything is open-ended. What Ann Basting likes to call beautiful questions. No right answers. You can answer them any way that you like. So from a bear that's discovered a box of cream of wheat coming out from hibernation, to women on a river in a boat viewing wildlife. I guess I only had a couple images, but just all kinds of images that we pulled from our galleries to spark those stories and give people a chance in smaller groups to get together and continue to look at works of art together. So thank you very much. Any questions? We do have a few questions, um, but I think I will leave those that Jessica can also answer until later. We'll have a group discussion on those. Um, but I just wanted to know for your specific program, what is, is there a cost or price to your, your tour? The tours are free. We decided early on when we instigated the program that we would not charge any of the groups that came for the tours. And we have regulars, we have um, residences who come, we're coming every month to engage in the tours. So we really want to get back to doing that once we open up more. And I just have a follow-up question thinking about it. Um, is, are they offered on a daily basis, weekly, monthly, or? So because we're working mostly with specific residences, we do offer according to their schedules. So for instance, one of this, the residences would, would come monthly. Uh, it really depended on how we fit into their activity schedule. We tried doing public tours where we would just put out an, this open invitation to come and then we'd have like on a certain day and time, but we, we didn't get as much response from that. So we found that just working with either meetup groups through Alzheimer's Association where people would gather at MIA or through uh, Rock Mahomes is a, an example of a group that comes, um, Wilder Foundation, and just schedule with them when they okay. wanted to come. So if someone wanted to come and weren't associated with any of those, how would you direct them to, to the Alzheimer's Association to join a meetup group or? Actually, anyone could, once we start up tours again, anyone could contact Mia and say, I have a group of six people who'd like to come, and then we would gladly set up a, a okay. tour for them. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. I, I do have some follow-up ones for, for later, so. Um, but now we are going to, to move on, and we're going to talk with Steve, who is going to tell us about uh, his program. And I think, actually, I will... I will take the. All right, there you go. Thank you very much. I've really enjoyed sitting on a personal note in this wonderful, beautiful space of the McNamara um, Alumni Center. And I'm looking out, I know that you're all at your home. I have a memory of coming to the University of Minnesota in 1972 and being in the marching band. And as you look out here, you see the arch that was brought for Memorial Stadium. And I remember as a marching band person, um, waiting in the tunnel and running through the tunnel and the arch out into the middle of the uh, game. And uh, it was fun to be in the marching band and it's been fun to sit here uh, looking at that arch that's so beautifully been remade in the McNamara Alumni Center. Um, I'm Steve, I manage the Minnetonka Senior Center. We're probably at a local level, a typical senior center. We offer a wide variety of programs and classes, special interest groups, services, uh, meals and trips. This uh, January starts my 40th year and there still is an awful lot to learn and an awful lot to try. Uh, one of the programs that we're excited about and we really enjoy doing the last few years is our Memory Cafe. 
and we offer that twice a month, and I'll talk about that. We also do the Dementia Friends class uh, on a regular basis. Uh, for our Minnetonka Memory Cafe, that would be twice a month. We do it once in the morning, once in the afternoon. That hour and a half length is works for us, and I think more importantly for the participants. We don't screen participants in terms of their ability. Our model is that they come as a couple, both the caregiver and the care receiver, and that's important. And so if you can picture everyone starting out together in the same room, we have simple treats, informal socializing for a while. I think dementia can be a very isolating uh, challenge for uh, people, and they enjoy simply having some informal socializing together. So we start out with treat socializing, and then we move on to the art project focus of the day. And during this time, we have a licensed social worker with Senior Community Services, and she leads a support group for about 50 minutes. And one of the realities is for a lot of caregivers is they have a hard time getting to a support group because they are challenged with who's going to take care of their loved one while they're at the support group. So having both simultaneously really works well. When that uh, support group and art activity is done, then everybody ends up in the same room again. We share what the art projects were for that day, and then folks go home. To make that all happen, obviously trained volunteers who have taken the Dementia Friends class is important. It's important for all of the teachers that come in from different organizations also to be trained about working with seniors uh, about memory loss and dementia. And we have partnered with a lot of wonderful teachers. Uh, Michelle sitting next to me here is, is one of them. And so these are some of the organizations that we have partnered with. Uh, the Minnetonka Center for the Arts for activities like poetry, painting, weaving, uh, writing poems, drawing. Uh, we've partnered with the U of M Extension Service, their wonderful growing connections master gardeners program. Examples would be like fresh flower arranging, planting seeds in the dirt to take home in a pot, creating fairy gardens, winter arrangements. We've toured the U of M landscape arboretum together. Uh, their volunteers bring in the supplies and teach. And we've also partnered with McPhail Center for Music with their Music for Life program. We've done taiko drumming both in person and virtually. Iris, one of their instructors, does a wonderful job with taiko drumming and sharing Japanese history. Uh, Kristen Rupp is the contact for Music for Life. For Ridgedale Public Library, um, they've been an important partner with us. And so they send staff to each of our memory cafes and they bring books about both memory loss, caregiving, what is Alzheimer's, what is dementia, um, and they also bring books about the topic of the day. So for example, if we're talking about gardening as a project, they will bring books on gardening and you're able to check out and bring back the next time uh, books that they have brought from the Ridgedale Public Library. So that's been wonderful. On the power of music, I would absolutely put a plug in for the power of music. I think the most amazing thing I've seen in our memory cafe is just the impact that music can have. Uh, we always start out, I lead with singing a couple of simple songs with everybody that they would be familiar with. Uh, music is such a powerful memory and certainly one of the last things that leaves for a lot of folks. And it is simply amazing to see people who have not been all that responsive at times to start singing and smiling on familiar songs, whether it's Happy Birthday or You Are My Sunshine or Edelweiss, whatever it is. So I would certainly put in a plug for the benefits of the art of singing together. Um, it's just a wonderful connection. On the artwork in the slides, and I guess feel free, Robin, to um, send through, yep. Um, on the, on the art, the slides, I guess my thought is, I think it's really important to focus on the person and not on the art project. And my observation is sometimes that care receiver may be having a bad day and they're simply not interested in creating art that day. And I think we all have to be ready to pivot and redirect and listen and smile and not get stuck 
on their not creating this finished art piece that we tried so hard to bring for them to do. Uh, and I think sometimes that friendly conversation can actually seem much more important than did they finish the art project. Um, the emotions certainly are remembered longer um, than the facts. And how we made them feel at the Memory Cafe um, has always been an important thing for us. On the importance of viewing and creating art of people with memory loss, uh, people enjoy all of their life taking home their art project and sharing with others. And that was actually a point of conversation we had. What happens when we're doing singing and they are not bringing home art projects for what you're seeing, for example, on the screen? Our volunteers have been a huge help, especially when the caregiver is in the support group. Our Zoom taiko drumming was something that they could do as a pair. And I think often that was very helpful. What's something that they could um, do together? The Minnetonka Center for the Arts with Mara Miller and a wonderful photographer, Eric Mueller, put together a great traveling photo exhibit of our memory cafe. And it was displayed at uh, Ridgedale Library out at the Minnetonka Center for the Arts for the Minnetonka Community Center, uh, displayed for many weeks out in the community. And I think it's important that the images of a memory cafe get out uh, at a local level. How COVID affected your program? Um, we certainly, like everybody else, went virtual. Our support group has continued the whole time. We have not had the Memory Cafe in person now for well over a year. We hope to start this fall. The reality is some folks are very comfortable with Zoom and others are not comfortable with Zoom. And I think you have to kind of meet people where they are at. Uh, one of the ways we did that is we started including our Memory Cafe folks specifically with our other center participants in what we called parking lot events during this last year. And two that I'll give examples of. Um, and they're not specifically for memory loss, but we had many memory loss participants come. One was story time with music. And if you picture a parking lot, kind of seems like a suburban thing, but if you picture a parking lot in Minnetonka, um, people came, they tuned in their FM radio and they listened, um, I would, read about a 15, 20 minute story. Uh, my wife and I would sing a couple songs. We would have everybody sing together a couple of songs in their cars. We'd share some popcorn and water and the whole thing took about 50 minutes an hour. People felt very comfortable staying in their car. It was something they could do together. They did not have to wear a mask and that worked out really quite well. Uh, the other thing that we've done um, fall, winter, and we had one just two days ago on Thursday, we've done parking lot bingo. And again, how is that related to memory loss? I think it's a fun activity that people can safely do, especially during the months when they didn't feel comfortable um, coming out. And one of our keys, um, parking lot bingo, you listen to the FM radio, honk your horn when, the win, when you win, uh, prizes come to you. Um, it's, it's, it's been fun. We did one Thursday of this week. We had 42 people playing parking lot bingo. So I think that's an example of an adaption. Um, and we've had celebrity, what we call celebrity bingo callers. Uh, we've had our ice arena manager. We've had uh, Chris Eckert was calling on uh, Thursday from up the street here from KSTP, one of the morning TV anchors. Uh, we've had the mayor call bingo. And what I've said to all of them is please talk about what you do. Bingo is not about the numbers, it's what else is going on. So for example, John, our ice arena manager was talking about how to drive a Zamboni and how do you make sheets of ice in an ice arena. Not something that our memory cafe folks are gonna do, but they found it actually interesting um, to learn about as, as we all did. We did um, and are still doing, we did one yesterday. We've done a lot of drive-through meal pickups because we're still not doing meals in the building. And so we had 70 people yesterday come by to pick up a meal. One of the ones that was the most emotionally draining or inspiring, I was really surprised at how it touched people's hearts. If you picture back several months ago when people were really in kind of the tough times 
of COVID and concern of their safety and wanting to get out of the house, but not wanting to get out of the house. We did several staff drive-bys in our parking lot. And if you picture a typical suburban parking lot and staff being spread around the whole parking lot, people stayed in their car. They simply drove around the circle and had many short conversations with people. And it was very moving to see how touched they were by simply coming back to the building again and seeing staff again as, as we were touched as well. And I was just in very impressed the importance of connecting with people. Um, one person had even taken, uh, they made the front of their car look like it was wearing a mask. That was, <laughs> that was one of the highlights for me. But I think um, in kind of wrapping up quickly, you're uh, focusing on the person, not the art project. Uh, focusing what is left, not lost, that hour and a half is a good length for uh, a memory cafe, and that art is such a powerful affirmation of the individual, um, that they're creating something new and that's really exciting. So thank you, and I will turn it back to Robin and the panel. Thank you, Steve. We have a question for you. Are these programs available to anyone or do you have to be a Minnetonka resident? The, the uh, programs are free and you can come from anywhere. Excellent. That's good. All right. Well, thank you very much. We're going to move on uh, where Michelle is going to talk about um, her program and she does a lot more with creating art. So it'll be very interesting to hear, you know, how your experiences have been with creating art. So um, I will give you the remote. And you can get So um, hello, my name is Michelle Coppin. I am an artist and a teaching artist. I teach at a variety of residences, day centers, community centers all around the Twin Cities. And I've been doing this for about 12 years. Um, I'm starting with a quote by Albert Einstein, uh, creativity is intelligence having fun. And we witness that every time seniors get into when they get into their projects, when they they become creatively engaged. Um, so being creative really um, increases participants' capacity for communication. We all know that people with memory loss have often have a hard time expressing themselves. And through painting, drawing, collage, they find a way with line, color, and shape to express themselves. And these examples of um, these paintings slash collages are expressing how these, these participants were feeling. The, the one in the foreground, tired, Helen turned the R on its side because he was sleeping or resting because he was so tired. So um, they find ways, even if they are um, rather silent, they find ways of expressing themselves quite creatively. Um, so I always start my classes with a poem or a story to put the visual arts program or project in a context. It sets the tone, it gets a conversation going. Um, at I work with Steve at uh, the Memory Cafe, and Steve would start with a, with a song, which would warm up the room. So um, um, starting with a poem and then creating a group poem together, which uh, with everybody saying a couple of sentences, and we would string them all together. And uh, this project was inspired by hands, where we emphasize what seniors enjoy doing with their hands currently, not so much what they used to do with their hands because they may not remember, but how, what do you like doing today? Um, and if they remember things from the past, that's great too. So we do an, they do an outline of their hands and then they add any kinds of colors and symbols and details that, um, that inspire them. We also look at a lot of examples of different interpretations of hand paintings throughout history and from different cultures. It, seniors are um, as varied as, as people of any age, so it's important to find 
art projects and poems and music that they can relate to. So um, I always make an effort to find, to, to put projects in a context that they, that will resonate with them. I, through a collaboration with the Alzheimer's Poetry Project, uh, I worked with um, Hmong elders through a translator. And um, so these are the Hmong, the Hmong elders paintings of hands. Um, oops. And uh, through, if, if, if projects are broken down into simple steps, the projects can be quite complex and, and amazing works of art can be created like these hand examples. Um, and this was a combination of oil pastels and watercolors. Um, we use really good quality art materials. Um, it's important to, it's a question of dignity to use real art materials as, a, as opposed to materials that are meant for children. It's, it's a way to res, of respecting the participants um, and they'll have a better outcome. So we, we use non-toxic, but good quality art materials. So the art projects are focused on different themes. This and the hand one is uh, focused mostly on um, uh, identity, which is a problem with uh, losing uh, one's memory. But this is, we focused on, this is who I am now. And the, the self-portraits are just wonderful. Um, yeah, they, sometimes they're a little bit discombobulated, but I showed them examples of Picasso's portraits. Uh, there's no right or wrong way of approaching any kind of project. The projects have to be fail-proof so that uh, participants don't feel like they're doing anything wrong. There, there never is a wrong way. So as a teacher, you have to be on your toes because the projects may go in a completely different directions than what you intended, and that's fine. And that's what sometimes is really uh, exciting. Um, and speaking of identity, we did uh, calendars with time life covers and uh, their photos. These are people I, I worked with for several years. So, so I could have pictures of them. I saw them every week for, I think, four years. And they chose a, a cover of a time life and put their self-portrait. And then they wrote a little a uh, biography or had help writing a biography and uh, put their birthplace and their birth date and put them on their door. It, it's, um, it was like their identity. Um, and then we focus on events and seasons. And sometimes the art projects are just fun. Uh, this, this was for Mardi Gras. And like anyone else, when uh, the participants wore masks, they become a little, a little wild. Uh, so we had, we've done this multiple times, um, and it's just a joy to watch participants let loose uh, under the mask of anonymity. Um, and again, they're, they're fun, and, and they, they get, um, they get a little goofy, like somebody was saying in another on another slide. It's it's fun to see them just let go, um, and then we also did uh, projects with uh, fall leaves, and we were trees, and we swayed in the wind, and I brought in some fall leaves so that people in residences don't, or, or people with memory loss don't spend that much time outside. So to be able to touch and manipulate natural elements is is a really nice break for them. Uh, so we had lots of fall leaves flying around the room that day. Um, um, another um, seasonal event, uh, Bastille Day, we were all Marie Antoinette's. Um, and we made wigs. Um, so they wore their wigs all afternoon. <laughs> um, and they decorated their wigs and acted like Mary. We didn't go all the way to the end of the story of Marie Antoinette. We just sort of celebrated her, her accoutrements. Um, and Marie Antoinette led to another project 
this was in the summer, of course, it was really, oops, it was really hot out. So we did a, a, pro, a project on fans and fanning yourself um, and how, how you hold your fan had different meanings. Ladies would send messages to their potential bows um, depending on how they wore, they held their fans. So we had fun with that too. Um, so a huge component of these art classes is the social aspect. Uh, participants make friends, they, they support each other, they collaborate. Um, and, and of course we did projects on, um, for Valentine's. Um, I often bring in examples of artists who, oops, artists who um, have worked, maybe done something similar here. We looked at Rothko with uh, mon monochromatic paintings and Jim Dine's hearts. So they knew that their artwork was in, exists in a context um, they could relate to or not. A lot of people didn't really get the Rothko paintings, uh, but they enjoyed the color. Um, and then uh, again, we create a poem, uh, a group poem inspired by love. Um, and those are always fun and we read them back to them and they read it back to each other. And um, so we, we work on with a lot of different materials. Um, these are tissue paper collages. The ones on top were, we were looking at cardinals, kind of inspired by Eric Carle's illustrations. Uh, and all, every cardinal had its own little personality. And on the bottom, we were celebrating Veterans Day and um, Flanders Fields with the poppies and the cross. So uh, seniors had, or participants had different interpretations of the Flanders Fields poem. Most of them knew the poem and recited it along with me. Uh, so they may not remember their address, but they do remember the poems like, I think, uh, they remember the Pledge of Allegiance, they, they'll remember. Um, I worked for a while in a, at a residence where once a month kindergartners would come to um, participate, which was absolute chaos. But the, it was so interesting watching the, the, the seniors attitude uh, versus when the kids were not there. When they, they're not there, they tended to be a little needy, but when the kids were there, they were nurturers and they were giving advice and they were helping out. Um, and this was a Thanksgiving project where I pinned the tail on the, on the um, turkey. Um, and then we do 3D projects and this is one inspired by dogs. I bring cart New Yorker cartoons uh, with no captions and they have to write in the captions and they have the most hilarious sense of humor. Um, and then I make these little cardboard structures with paper, uh, paper towel holders and, and tape and they, using model magic, dress and create these dogs and these, this leads to moments of hilarity as well. The dogs make friends, they bark at each other, they get names, they, people tell stories about the dogs they had in the past. Some of the residences have dogs. Uh, so the dogs would come in and visit. Um, and here are some, some of the dogs. And then around Christmas, we'll turn the dogs into um, reindeer. Um, and they're just so goofy and they each have their own personality. The one on top is an un unidentifiable creature, very Picasso-like. Um, and then for the Hmong, again, like I was saying, it's important to know who you're working with and find projects that will resonate with them, their culture. And the Hmong don't have a strong connection to dogs, not like Minnesotans, but the, the tigers feature in a lot of their folk tales. So instead of making dogs, we made tigers. Um, speaking of ferocious animals, I, oops, I also do this project inspired by Peter and the Wolf. We listen to the different instruments and the characters they represent. And then we make a wolf using um, geometric shapes and they have to figure out how to put them together. But the whole story is, I put the emphasis on um, the role of the grandfather and as grandparents, what would be your advice to Peter? And their advice is just wonderful. Uh, 
stay out of the <clears throat> field. <laughs> um, and again, it puts them in control of the story. Um, so we do a lot of weaving, which is good hands, hand eye coordination. Um, around Jul July 4th or Veterans Day, we weave flags. So we just use black, uh, uh, blue, red, and white fabric. Otherwise we use a variety of colors. Uh, and then we mount them on colored backgrounds and we did the same thing with the, the Hmong elders. Uh, they end up looking like fields of flowers and um, we do a lot of quilting, um, but through collage with patches, uh, square patches and rectangle pa patches of fabric. Um, so many participants have a history, a tradition of quilting, whether they remember seeing their mothers and grandmothers quilting or if they quilted themselves. Men really get into the, the creating these uh, geometric patterns. Um, and again, these projects are fail-proof, so no matter how you put them together, they come out looking beautiful. Having said that, I always put the emphasis on the process rather than the final product, because it, the most important is for seniors to feel joy and a sense of engagement with a project. What comes out, of course, is wonderful, it's, it's beautiful, but that's not the primary goal. Um, we do uh, projects based on imagination. This, uh, we made uh, postcards. Um, the image is created with water, with a variety of watercolor techniques, and then, and the the theme is, uh, you go on a trip, a, an imaginary trip, or a trip you went, you might have gone on, and you're sending your postcards back to a loved one. And where did you go? And what do you have to say about it? Um, so, they're wonderful imagine um, imagination. Men, uh, um, um, they went on these imagine, imaginary trips. And then this Jim wrote a postcard to Donald Trump at the St. Paul Capitol saying, hi, Don, on our trip to the Black Hills, we saw the Sioux Indian sacred totem of Bear Butte. I think St. Paul would uh, use a little more sacredness in our political doings. <laughs> um, and then I bring a lot of, uh, like I said earlier, a lot of natural uh, elements for, for seniors to handle and, and manipulate. This was uh, a collage inspired by the lakes. Everybody has a history of going to the lakes um, or nature collages, bringing flowers and twigs and grass and creating um, uh, these beautiful natural um, images. And again, we did a poem on trees. Um, my favorite is uh, this one. I think that I shall never see a poem as lovely as a tree. Um, and then there's a duck in the background. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's taking, when we start with the poems, it's really taking the connecting the words to images um, in unexpected ways sometimes. I also bring a lot of flowers, especially in winter. I have a wonderful relationship with a um, Trader Joe's on Wayzata Boulevard. They give me their week old flowers. They give me carts and carts and carts of flowers. Uh, so I bring in a ton of flowers. They, I leave them for the seniors and we paint. The flowers are just an inspiration. They, they're uh, an excuse to use color. Sometimes just pushing color around can be very satisfying. It doesn't have to ever look like a flower bouquet. Uh, but just having the smell of flowers in the middle of winter, getting some color is so uh, uh, therapeutic. Um, and we do printing, uh, monoprints, again with um, natural elements. It's quite process oriented, but do it step by step and the are capable of absolutely beautiful artwork. Um, so we do um, still lives. And the first time I, I brought in little pumpkins and some gourds to create, a, every, every participant had a gourd and a still life to paint, to a pumpkin to paint and got everything set up, got all the palettes out. And I said, okay, let's paint the pumpkins. And they all painted the pumpkins. 
<laughs> which is fine. And it's turned out to be a really fun project. And ever since then, we do a paint the pumpkin project. Um, but then we also do actual still lives. Um, and then one of my favorite projects um, is based on breath and breathing um, and relaxing. We do a little bit of meditation and breathing exercises. And in, to encourage them to breathe in and out, I bring uh, soap bubbles. And soap bubbles are fun at any age. So they blow their bubbles. They blow bubbles at each other. They, they blow the biggest bubble possible. And I was with this one group, and everybody was blowing bubbles. And then they started singing all together. Um, I'm Forever Blowing Bubbles, a song by Doris Day, which I had never heard. They knew the whole song. They sang it over and over again. And now I always I found it on my phone. I put it on. Everybody was singing together. Um, it was just the, a magical moment. Um, and then we also created a, a poem, a group poem inspired by the bubbles. And then this leads to a, a, a painting uh, done with breath where I'll drop a a little puddle of ink on the page and they blow through a straw. They, they blow the ink around and they end up looking like trees or bushes and we celebrate trees and then we celebrate spring coming and the, the leaves that are going to grow on trees and they're just the most, again, a very organic, very loose uh, project that is totally fail proof and is uh, creates spectacular results. Um, and then we do, we talk about bodies, um, we do collages inspired by gardening. Everybody has some connection to gardening using animal heads and gardening, a little bit like paper dolls, um, where they, they choose their outfits, they choose their, their harvest, they choose their um, trees and bushes and flowers, um, they get very goofy and you never know sometimes these the most spectacular artwork emerges from these the the one on the left oh, this was done at Minnetonka um the the artist wrote um I I spot a smiling mouse in a late night sorry I can't say it's too far away but anyway it's this very surreal little poem uh, she took her gardening, the gardening project, and took it to somewhere, somewhere completely different. And it, and it's an amazing work of art. Um, and of course, we at the end of every pro project or session, we bring, we we show everybody's art. We celebrate it. We talk about it. They find a title for it, which leads to more conversations. Um, so I love this last slide because it just shows the the social aspect of um, these art classes. This is Sheila and Shar helping each other out and uh, we were painting flowers and Shar was giving Sheila some advice and it just these little magical moments of intimacy that develop amongst um, participants is, is, um, is so special, especially considering seniors with memory loss are in transition and they are sometimes overwhelmed by loss of memory, loss of um, community, loss of loved ones, loss of, loss of self-identity. So being put in the role of a creator restores um, their a sense of self as a creator, as um, a, a, an artist, as a poet. Um, so and then I think I have one more. Oh, this is, whoops, this is just a little self-promotion. My colleague and friend, Holly Nelson, and I have written a book on, um, uh, it's, it's called Maps, Meaningful Art Projects for Seniors with and without memory loss. Uh, when I first started working with seniors, there was so little, uh, there is very little on, on what kind of art projects would be appropriate for seniors with memory loss. Um, a lot of it was inspired by children's projects using children's art materials, which is infantilizing and um, I think very discouraging for seniors to be put in that position. So we wrote a book with our best, most 
our best projects that respect their dignity as adults, um, that are meaningful, that are fun, that are fail-proof. We're just shopping around for a publisher. So it's, it's, it's there, it's happening. Um, yeah, at some point. Um, and as far as COVID, all my projects have been shut down. Um, I'm really excited that uh, the Memory Cafe is starting again in August, but other than that, I think most residences are planning on reopening in 2022. So um, I'll we'll eagerly wait to pick up again. I have a, a question then. If somebody wasn't a part of a residence, is there any way, do you, have, do you offer classes or or anything, would you be willing to do something like that for the? Oh, for sure. The I, I actually work with some um, adults with disabilities sort of privately. Okay. So that's possible. Also, I work with the, or I was working with the gathering through Lynn Bloomston's um, where um, uh, the participants are dropped off for the day and it's free. It's the, the centers are sort of sprinkled all over St. Paul and Minneapolis, I believe. And so they could join into one of those um, sessions. Um, so they're day centers, residences, uh, community centers. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Um, we have a few questions um, and some are for Jessica too. So I want to make sure that we can get her back in with us. Um, but I have to ask, your collage pieces, mm -hmm. do, do you pre-cut them or is that part of the project? It's part of the project. Excellent. So they, they decide what they want and... They okay. cut them where, however they want. Sometimes they just cut an eye out. Sometimes they use the whole image. It's, okay. they're the artists, they're in charge and they decide. But I do use um, images that I print out um, ahead of time, not from magazines because I found that Images from magazines are unattractive, they're confusing, there's all this print. So um, I bring a pile of really good images for them to pick from. So I make files of images of animals and plants and body parts. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. excellent. I wouldn't have thought about the magazine being, but I could totally see that. Yeah, people yeah. get confused and, and, and the, the paper itself is um, thin. Yeah, it yeah. dissolves. And, I wanted to say too, just to comment on what you were saying about how you know it is hard when you're a senior when you have memory loss to have that feeling of autonomy and, and, mm -hmm. and independence and and how these art projects taking part like it does give them a sense of control and they're doing so, you know it just I think that must be really empowering for them so mm -hmm. it's fantastic. Um, so okay, some of the questions are more specific about the different programs logistics wise like art museums do you have like specific tour guides that are trained to do this or is it everyone is is able to anyone who works there can can take these or give these tours so we were very intentional about that we had training sessions so that people could self-select as i said we have over 300 volunteers but it turns out that we have a small group of, it's ranged from about eight to 12 people. And we started out with some very specific trainings where we brought in Alzheimer's Association. Um, Ann Basting came to talk about her storytelling project. We worked with Gary Poetry. So we had initial trainings, but then we have always had refresher trainings too. So new people could get involved, but we felt it, it was very important that this is such a different kind of tour from a, a regular museum tour. And so we wanted people, first of all, to, to buy in, to say, yes, this is what I wanna do. Um, and then to, to just learn about the whole aspects of slowing down. You know, when, when you're planning tours where you wanna run around a museum on a regular tour and show as much as you can, this is really a tour about three or four objects staying in one area it's, you know, the people who come often are in wheelchairs or have mobility issues. So the training has been very important for us, for people to, to know what's the best way to conduct this kind of tour. I like, too, that they self-select so you know that there are people who are very interested and, and up for the task. Yeah. Excellent. In fact, they often say, um, 
you know, how much patience it takes and people get so attached. We have the regular visitors, you know, I was saying how some groups come monthly. They get so attached to the men and women who come regularly. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, I, Jessica, if you're on and can answer, I had a couple questions about uh, the walker too. I, I didn't get a chance to ask if your program uh, has a fee um, and also if your tour guides are also trained or um, how that works there. Yeah, as far as our tour guides, it's exactly the same as at Mia. We have a very small uh, group of individuals that have been specifically trained and also have volunteered saying, I really, really want to be involved in this program. Um, we did charge a fee of $5 per person um, previously. I'm hoping in the future it's something that we can offer for free. I can't say for sure. Um, and care partners were free. So just be $5 per participant and then free for the care partner. Um, but yeah, I, I hope it's something that we can do for free in the future. That'd be great. I mean, $5 is still great. So especially for two people. Um, while well, I have you on, is there anything that uh, you find that the guests kind of flock to that, it, that like, are there like really like um, different types of artwork or projects that they do that they really seem to like more than others? I think in general, um, people tend to be really drawn to paintings, especially the figural ones, and especially at a museum like the Walker. We don't have that as much. <laughs> we have kind of the more... Um, you know, what people consider strange artwork because a lot of it's really conceptual. So when well, we do have shows that um, include a lot of figurative works, we for sure like to um, create a tour that is based on that exhibition or that includes um, those more accessible works in it, like portraiture and things like that. Excellent. Okay, um, another question. This is for, for all of you. Um, how do you bring a diverse community to enjoy the various art projects and how diverse are the art projects? I can also answer that one. I um, answered it in the chat before. Um, so we reach out, sorry, I'm getting that echo again. We reach out to um, different groups in the Twin Cities. You know, we also have groups that come frequently, but we're always kind of trying to um, expand our network. So we'll look up different places and invite them to come. We also do our drop-in dates. So um, that's a nice way to get people to come in for a free visit and see if it's um, something that's for them. Um, and as far as when we design our tours, we really do try to be very diverse and very intentionally diverse in um, the tours that we do. So we always make sure you know, do we have artists who are people of color? Do we have female artists? Do we have um, sculptures, paintings? I mean, unless we're focusing on a specific artist, you know, we recently had a Jasper Johns show, so that was one specific focus. But if we're looking at our permanent collection, it's like, let's look at a sculpture, let's look at a painting, let's look at um, a print, you know, and, and make it very, very diverse that way. Um. I should have asked you this earlier too. So do you, uh, you said you had like the drop-in Sundays, is that that's for the general kind of for everybody? Did you say Sundays or did I just come up with that? Cause I oh, it's, right, so. we do it three to four times a year. Um, okay. And we don't have any on the schedule right now just because with the pandemic, we haven't gotten back into that. But um, yeah, they're typically on a Saturday around 11 or 12 o'clock um, and totally free. Anyone can come, you don't need to register for it. And if, if somebody wanted to come who wasn't like in a group, would they be able to go to, on your tours like the Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, even if someone wanted to schedule a private tour, we're super, super open, super flexible. Um, we'll work with your schedule. If you've only got two people, I mean, that's something that we can talk about for sure. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, anything to add to the diversity? I mean, I know you, I, you had a lot of pictures of, of the Hmong group and, you know, so. And African-Americans yeah. and um, a lot of Latinos. So depending on which part of the city, um, we get a, a variety. And that's why it's important to find projects, poems and music that relates 
to that particular group and that they will resonate with. Um, yeah, I really appreciate that. And it's, it is because you have to really like be very conscious of thinking of that for like the dog. Like it's like, oh, dogs, everyone loves dogs, but you're absolutely right. Like in their culture, the, the tiger is going to be much more of a hit than it's going to be the dog, you know? Like, that's great. But I, so, yeah, it's fantastic. Um, all right. Other questions. Um, I'm just going to start reading through them now. I kind of had them in, in an order that made sense, but now we're just going to go random. So um, can people find content from your book, even though it isn't published yet? Um, not really. <laughs> unfortunately, if anybody knows of a publisher who would be interested in, unfortunately, it's not a very sexy subject, uh, art projects for seniors. Um, but if they contact me, I can share some art projects with them. But unfortunately, the book is not out yet. And we're probably going to end up self-publishing. Um, but uh, it's pretty cost. Of, um, we want to put a lot of big pictures so, right. so people okay. understand how to uh, follow the steps. So we're working on it. Hopefully, this in the next year or so, it'll be available. We have a lot from the slides that we went through that they'll be on our website that you can look. I mean, I think that's one of the great things is like these are ideas that you could do at home too. I mean, you know, like there's so many of them. Even, you know, like they're looking at a picture and writing a story or coming up with a story together. Like that's something you could easily do at home. And not, I mean, I was just blown away by the different types of art projects you were doing. I mean, it was just like so diverse from like the blowing of the paint to the collages to weaving. I mean, so many different things. So it's a lot of really great ideas for people to take from this and, and apply. Well, I, I make the projects first. I practice, I invent them. And if I have fun making them, then I figured other, other people will have fun too. Some of them I've tried and they were a total flop. And actually, um, <clears throat> can I just tell a little story about this? Yeah, so when I started about 12 years ago, I, I couldn't find any, any books about um, successful art projects for people with memory loss. So I looked at YouTube, I, I looked at all sorts of different sites, and one site for my first project that I inspired by YouTube was uh, one project was to create mandalas with participants with memory loss. Um, so I printed out big, simple mandalas for them. I gave them... Um, um, pastels and watercolors. They did not understand the concept of a mandala. They couldn't stay within the lines. It was a total flop. They were frustrated. It was just, it was terrible. So, okay, so that was not to be repeated. I realized I had to create projects that I, that resonated with me as well. <clears throat> so a few months later, I did another project with the same group where I just played music that they could relate to. And I gave them the same materials, pastels and watercolors. And I told them to start in the middle and listen to the music and let it flow. They all created mandalas. They weren't round necessarily, but they were, they, they were flowing. Uh, they followed the rhythms of the music. They were, they're gorgeous and they were so pleased with them and it was it was like okay this is how to approach an art project find something that resonates with them let them float i i also tell them when they get frustrated if they think that they have to stay within the lines that the artists who became famous throughout history are the ones who did not stay in the lines the ones who broke the rules the ones who did not follow the steps that the instructor is telling them to follow so and that puts everybody at ease like whatever you do it's going to be great and you'll make get really famous. <laughs> so creating a fun context and background where they feel comfortable that they can mess up or so-called mess up because they're very particular. They don't want to spill. They don't want to go beyond the lines. But giving them permission to, to uh, not do that is really important and sets a tone of acceptance and, um, and, and creativity. Uh, it reminds me, my daughter just said the, the other day that they they shouldn't get graded for art. Like that kind of, you know, like there is that kind of feeling when you, you know, you start an art project that it has to be good. And I love that you just kind of set that tone immediately that this is whatever you do is good. There is no bad here. So it's fantastic. Um, Michelle, how long are your art project sessions? 
about an hour and a half, um, just like the ones at the Memory Cafe. Um, it, participants need a certain amount of time to, to settle into the project. Um, an hour and a half, I think, is plenty because they get tired. Um, shorter than an hour and a half, projects get rushed and you really want to give participants the time to just explore and and be in their zone. Uh, so I wouldn't recommend shorter than an hour and a half. Uh, sometimes they go longer if, if we can, um, but usually I would say 90 minutes is a good amount of time. And our last question, um, what guidelines do you use for any program to ensure that you're not infantilizing, infantilizing. Um, besides, we, we covered, it's a, in the question, the, the high quality art project or art materials, but what else do you do to help, you know, so it doesn't feel like they're being treated as, as children or, or not given their dignity? And it sounds like, I should say, like from what you all have said, it sounds like your programs put that kind of as a priority to, to make sure that they feel dignity and, and in control of what they're doing. Well, I'll go ahead and just say in, in looking at works of art, the way that you ask the questions, the fact that you, you want to hear what people have to say, what are they seeing? What does it remind them of? You know, speak from their own experience. What's happened in their lives? How can they connect to an image that they're looking at? Um, just asking questions that give people a, a chance to reflect on their own lives. I think that I liked what you said about dignity and making sure that people feel included and um, what they have to say is significant, that there are no right or wrong answers. We want you to share from your own life experience. All right, well, thank you all very much. It's 4.15, so we will wrap up, but I really appreciate all your time. Jessica, thank you so much for Zooming in with us, and thank you for being here, and, and, and all this has been great. Thank you. I'm pass it on to Joe. Thank you guys for spending the day with us, too. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for the AV. <laughs>